So well, um, I've been on this little run. Of, oh, that's a bit close. But I'm going to hit that. Been on this little run of um, doing three weeks in a row around this whole area of joy. Uh, and joy is the big picture idea that I'm talking about. In fact, it's not an idea. It's the very, very thing that God wants at the center of all our lives, right? Uh, that's the point. Uh, and we've touched different things. So we've talked about how the very way that we knit together with God in our relationship with him and if we abide with him is the way that we find joy at its most pure, okay? There is no, there is no joy outside of relationship with God, ultimately, because it's a relational thing designed by him for us. It's the very thing he wants for us. That was week one. Last week, we were talking about the biggest joy killer that there might exist, which is offense. This idea that we take on offense, bitterness grows in our hearts, and then we, leads us to a place of unforgiveness, which is the enemy's only, first and only way of separating us from God and each other. That's what he's about, okay? Trying to take us to a place as far from God as possible. Now, this week, we're going to be talking about how then God wants to knit us together, not just with him, but with each other as well, okay? Uh, through proximity, being close together. But I just want to say one thing quickly about last week, because in the end, all of these things connect together, and that's the point. So, it wouldn't surprise me if over the last week, many of us have been invited by the enemy to take offense in some way at something. I don't know about you, that's been my experience this week. He's not that happy that we're put shining light on this issue. And if you've had the opportunity to take offense this week, then today is your first opportunity to lay that down again and start to have short accounts on these things. I just want to say a very quick thing about the difference between condemnation and conviction. You know, I was saying some pretty strong stuff last week, as well as some very vulnerable things. The idea isn't that I put something on you and you feel bad. Okay, that's condemnation. We're not interested in that. What we're interested in, in is the work of the Holy Spirit within us. When the Holy Spirit speaks to us and sh shines a light on something in our lives, that's conviction. And then we have to do something about it. So as you're looking to have eyes and ears as to whether the Lord wants to do a work in your heart... The, the, the key is to go, is the Holy Spirit bringing conviction? Then I'm going to respond. If somebody else is trying to lay something on me, then I'm going to ignore it, okay? It's the work of the Spirit. So, on to this week, proximity. I suppose the conclusion I'm going to come to this week is that if we want to grow as disciples of Jesus, which I do, and I hope that you do, then there is an absolutely essential vehicle designed for us as human beings to take us to that place that is joy-filled, uh, has close, loving relationships with one another, and keeps us in a place where we know and we feel loved and we feel deep, deep joy. And that is community, okay? So I'm going to be talking to you a little bit, in the end, about our reach communities today. And what I want to show us is that... This isn't working. There we go. What I want to show us is that proximity promotes joy. And joy fuels our growth, and Jesus actually commands that we live in this way. Okay, so here we go. Just right from the off, something deeply joyous for you. There you go. <laughs> Who feels filled with joy as you look into my eyes? Look at that. Should we just stare and appreciate that fine picture for a while? Move on. Move on. Okay. Now, I, I have three teenage girls, okay? So the story I'm about to tell you doesn't actually, if I'm honest, apply to them today as teenagers, and you'll understand what I mean if you've got teenagers. But when they were small, when they were small, I used to, from time to time, go away on work trips or different things, like that, and I would be separated from them, okay? And I would call them up on an evening on the phone, and you know, I would try and speak to them, and it, it, they, they'd seem pleased to hear my voice. Like, Hello, Daddy. But they, they, you know, they weren't really there, because I, I could tell they were watching Peppa Pig, or whatever it was, and before long, they were gone. You know? But it was nice to speak to Daddy, but really, I can't see Daddy, and so somehow in their minds, I wasn't quite there, and it didn't last very long. But when I got home from those trips, and I opened the door, and they saw my face, even that face, they would run towards me, filled with joy, and they would jump on me. And it was just the most beautiful, 
just joy-filled experience that I, I could wish for. And you could see that there was joy in their eyes and their faces as well. And it wasn't actually just when I went away for a period of time. When they were small, it was like that just when I came home from work on an evening. It was as if I had been away for weeks. And, and they, they would see me and they'd run and they'd jump on me. And what a beautiful experience that was. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that if you've got kids, that that is not an experience that is unfamiliar to you. This is the design of God in us, his creatures. It might be a story that reminds you of your experience with your own children, or perhaps uh, your own childhood with a father or mother or caregiver. It may be a story that causes you some pain, as it might emphasize a lack of something in your, uh, your journey through life, or even your journey perhaps today. Perhaps that joy, that, that sparkle in someone's eyes is missing from your life. And me just telling that story is really putting a finger on that. Well, the good news is that Jesus wants to help us to do something about that today, okay? Uh, I mentioned this guy two weeks ago. This is a guy called Dr. Alan Shaw. He's one of the world's leading neuroscientists, right? And this guy's research using brain scanning technology and different things like that tells us that joy is the experience that we have when we see the sparkle in someone's eye, when we look into their face, and we know that we're loved, that we're welcome, that they're pleased to see us. That's how our brains, our minds, are designed to experience joy, by looking into someone's face, okay? That's science. Isn't that incredible? That's what science tells us. Actually, it's also what Scripture tells us. And the, the thrilling thing to my heart is that we are continually seeing how science is catching up with, script, with what Scripture has always been telling us. That as we go through the day, our brains are continually scanning. They're looking for opportunities to look into someone's eyes, look into someone's face, and see that sparkle and see that connection, because that's what sparks joy in human beings. This is the design of God, okay? Well, we just sang that song. That wasn't by accident. We sang that on purpose because, you know what? That song isn't just a good song. It's actually Scripture. Do you know that? I, I hope you do. We're singing Scripture over each other when we sang that song. And Tom's encouraging us to sing it to each other because it's a song from a Scripture that's designed to be spoken to each other, from God, but to each other, to bind us together. It's a promise of God. It's from Numbers 6. It says this, uh, the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And so they put my name on the, so they, and so they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Okay? This is what God is telling his people through the leaders of the Israelite community. That when the Lord's face shines upon you, he's gracious to you. When the Lord's face is turned towards you, peace transmits to you. Okay? And, and this is something that, um, that actually has taken hold in the church. I don't you may come from a different church tradition. When I was young and uh, growing up in a Baptist church, the, the pastor would say this over the people every week. Yeah, he would speak this blessing over people because it speaks of something that God wants to echo through the generations. The Lord's face looks upon us and we connect with his face and that joy that transmits from him, that sparkle. That's, Tom just described it beautifully, doesn't it? It's like he lifts us up like a baby and he looks into our eyes. And that's how the face of God is designed uh, to bless us and fill us. Now, um, Psalm 16 is one of my favorite psalms. And in Psalm 16, there's this verse. It says, in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. Okay? Now, that connects to everything I was saying in our first week together, that when we are present with God, there is fullness of joy. In other words, that closeness to God is the context for joy to spill over into our lives. It requires, again, that proximity and that relationship. So fullness of joy means complete joy. In the presence of God, there is 
completeness, fullness of joy. There's no room, therefore, for anything else. That's what God wants for us. But what I want us to understand today is that actually the word presence is often poorly translated in the Bible. And what, what, the, what the Hebrew actually says, it uses this phrase, with your face, okay? With your face. So this would be better translated, not, not so much as in your presence there is fullness of joy, but more like this. With your face, Lord, there is fullness of joy. Or there is fullness of joy with your face. Yep. And you will see this repeated through the Scriptures if you dig into it. And I'm not no Hebrew scholar, don't get me wrong. But if you dig into it a bit, you'll see that this is repeatedly the, the case. And there's something that's um, lost in translation because we have a cerebral way of understanding the presence of God um, but we don't necessarily fully understand what it really means to have this relational thing rather than cerebral thing about the face of God. And that's what God actually wants for us. With your face, says the Lord, with my face, there is fullness of joy. So there's three things that um, at this point, as we've been going through, um, there you go, uh, that are probably conclusions to be building on. Number one, joy is primarily transmitted through the face and therefore requires proximity to each other as well as to God. We sing this to each other so that we get that proximity and that joy from each other as well as from God. Number two, joy is relational in its nature, okay? Anything that is, feels joy-filled but doesn't have relationship into it is a poorer form of joy than the one that God wants for you. And finally, joy is so important to God because it's the fuel on which we're designed to run. When I'm filled with joy, I am able to do all of the other things that God's called me into my life. When I lack joy, I am like a car with no fuel. And so there's something about knowing and being known in the design of God. There's a human yearning to know people and to be known. And it's our pain and our brokenness and offense and the work of the enemy that wants to separate us from each other and isolate. But deep down in the design of God, a desire to know and to be known is actually in the DNA of who we are. Okay, so this is a scripture we've been looking at. It's John 15. This, this time we're going there from 1 to 17. I won't read it all for the sake of time. Um, but we've been in this quite a bit. Essentially, this is uh, Jesus appealing to the disciples about the vine and the branches and saying that they are to be intertwined. And we are to abide in him, and he's to abide in us. And we talked about, didn't we, in the first week, it's a, you can listen on YouTube if you missed it, that that abiding is the very same thing that we see Paul talking about in Ephesians. It says we're no longer dead, but we're alive, and we're alive in Christ. We're in Christ in the heavenly realms, and nothing of, of, of the enemy Nothing can touch us because we're united in him. So we abide in him and he abides in us and that beautiful relationship, relational joy is there for us. This is the abiding that uh, Jesus talks about here. And verse 11, he says, um, and I've told you all of this, all this stuff about abiding so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Verse 12, it says this. My command is this. I should move this on. Is it all on there? I don't know whether you can read all that. But it says it, verse 12 says this. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this. To lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that whatever you, do, you ask in, the name, in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? There's this whole thing about how we should abide in him, with him. He tells us that that's for, the, for our joy, that his joy might be in us and our joy might be full. And the very next thing he says, so this is my command, love each other. That's a strong word, command. It means, this is what I am instructing you to do. 
Now, when we know that Jesus loves us, right? So when he gives us an instruction, it's not something um, born out of anything other than his love. In other words, when he gives us an instruction, he, sa- he does it because he knows it's for our best. So, abide, find this joy, and now love one another. Why is it a command? Have you ever thought about that? Here's what I think. I think it's a command because Jesus knows that this spiritual battle that we talked about last week, this idea that the enemy wants to separate us, is going on all the time. So he's strong. This is my command. Love each other. Find proximity. Yeah? It's not just enough, says Jesus, to love God and find proximity with him. You cannot work out your faith as a believer and come to a place where you will ultimately grow into all he's called you to be if you relate to God but you ignore everybody else. He calls us to be prox- in proximity with each other and to love each other. I can't love anyone if I'm not close. I can't share my heart with anyone if I'm not close. So this love requires proximity. It's not his suggestion, it's his command. Let's pick up on two words that we see uh, regularly in the um, Hebrew and the Greek language, but not necessarily um, fully understanding them as they're translated into the English as we go through the scripture. The first one is the word agape, which is one of four translations of love in Greek, okay? And agape means unconditional love. It means a love that has no hook, a love that doesn't expect anything back. That's the word that Jesus uses in verse 12 and 13. Agape one another, love each other unconditionally, without a hook, expecting nothing in return. This is uh, like many of the, the, the words in Greek that we see and the way, the way that the, the Bible comes out, that the heart of God comes out, it's uh, hard to get your ha- head around with just one word. But this word is so powerful and important in the Scriptures that Paul, in 1 Corinthians 13, takes an entire chapter to unpack what it means. He says, love is patient, doesn't he? And love is kind. And love keeps no record of wrong. This is love. This is agape. This is a big deal to God. How can I do that if I'm not close to others? Lay down your lives for one another, says Jesus. The other word that comes more through in the Hebrew is the word Hesed, should I be pressing this button? Oh, not yet. Uh, Is the word hesed, which kind of means an enduring covenant. So a covenant is a commitment between two people to effectively, unconditionally love one another. And hesed is a a word in the Hebrew that's, again, hard to fully uh, unpack, but it means means everlasting covenant. It means the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Okay? And this word, again, comes through the Old Testament time and time again. And it kind of talks, it kind of speaks of this idea of being attached, okay? Of being attached to one another. That's interesting, isn't it? Because John 15, the vine and the branches, is about being attached to God. It's about being grafted in. And this word hesed, This idea of steadfast love, enduring covenant, is about being grafted in to one another. This, says Jesus, is what I command of you, that you be be connected in. Let me just read this quote to you from another great book called The Other Half of Church by a guy called Jim Wilder. He's one of two authors. It says this, Attachment is the strongest force in the human brain. It's not an emotion, although we feel it strongly. And attachment runs much deeper in the brain below willful control. In other words, this is something that is subconscious or pre-conscious. Our relational connection to one another is not something that we consciously think about. It's something that happens at a deeper level in our minds. Attachment is the best word scientists could find for what glues people together and little creatures to their parents. It produces an enduring, there's that word again, care for the well-being of another. Attachment is a life-giving forever bond with no mechanism in the brain to unglue us. 
If God has an enduring love for us that brings us good, the only force in the human brain that can understand such a lasting kindness and care is the brain's attachment system. Okay? So science is telling us that we have a system in our brains which is designed to look for this attachment. Jesus is telling us to attach to one another. The question is, to whom are we attaching? And what does that look like? And attachment theory is a whole other thing that we could go into, which is for another day, but it's um, quite a powerful, there's quite a powerful theory behind it about how young children attach to parents from a young age. God is calling us through all these scriptures to understand that this is his design in us, it's in our brains, and it's in his word, it's in his scripture, and it's in his commands that we attach to one another. Now, I could go on about this. Who we attach to is significant in our lives, right? When I was a student, I lived with a bunch of of um, not yet believers, uh, six of us in a house, and then I was, I was also part of a Christian union. And I had this battle going on all the time as to um, who's influencing who. And when I was with the Christian union, I was kind of in this Christian tight-knit community, and there was something of what was going in and on, on in and amongst us that was forming me to be more like Jesus. And when, when I was with that group over there, there was something that was forming me to be something other than like Jesus. And I had this battle going on, and I was hoping all the time that we, when I went into this group of six, that the, my influence to them was stronger than their influence to me, even though it was six on one. It was difficult. It was very difficult. Why? Because the way we're designed by God is that we do find ourselves connected to others and we do begin to be informed by one another, okay? That's just the design of God. That's what happens. Who's informing your shape? Because what Jesus calls us to do is to love one another, to find proximity regularly, and to be shaping one another. And that is how we grow. We find that joy in each other's faces, and we inform one another. We, we kind of ask, answer this question. How do my people live, behave, and believe? And wherever we find that attachment, we'll inform those things. And this is a subconscious, pre-conscious thing that's going in our minds. Growth doesn't just come from reading stuff and then trying to apply it somehow. That's not how transformation happens. Willpower doesn't transform us in the end. It doesn't, just doesn't work. Anyone, if you've tried to do something on your own through willpower, it's probably failed. But if you're in a community of people who are walking together and are shaping one another, that's how we grow. Because, and this is a whole other topic for another time, but that's because the way that our brains work is such that the, the, the kind of right brain that we have informs our growth more than the left, and the left is conscious. But we're informed and we grow by engaging the other, and that's through relationship and the power of the Holy Spirit. Am I making sense? I hope so, because this is important. <laughs> okay. So where are we attaching? Or, and perhaps another question might be, are we attaching at all? Because I think it's pretty clear that this is the way, this is what Jesus is saying to us. And it's also what he lived, isn't it? He had the twelve that he walked with and sowed into and walked with all the time. The early church started by meeting like this, but also in homes. Scriptures say they met at the temple courts daily, but they met in homes, in community, sharing life. I could get on one about this, but there's something significant and exciting happening in this church. I'm just hearing Holly, who was excited when Holly was talking about how we've gone from 30 to 60 to nearly 90 kids in eight weeks. God's doing something amongst us. When we stand together and we sing and we have all those voices singing all of those different things, from all those, different, those, those same words from different languages. I don't know about you, but my, I had goosebumps. The presence of God is palpable. And he's saying, in this room, in this space, together there is something of God happening, which we see in the, uh, we see in the scriptures of an intercultural dynamic picture of heaven but I really feel strong that he wants to say to us, but that's, it's not enough. It's not enough. It's a good experience today, but he wants us to take it to the next level and say, okay, now what does it look like for us to be knitted together, to be grafted into the vine with him, to be attached to one another, okay? Because you can come and you can go from a meeting, but you can't belong. And the way God is building his church 
always has been. And the way he's building this church is by saying, okay, now what's it going to look like for you to be knitted together, to be really family on a whole other level, to be people who are informing and shaping each other through joy-filled, tight relationships. That's the challenge to us. And it comes right out of the heart of John 15. Esther and I have been um, re-engaging with a REACH community recently. I've I've been out for a long time, spent a lot of time isolated on my own in the last year. We've been re-engaging with community. And one of the things that we've been doing each week is taking time with our group to just have 10 minutes where one person in our group tells their story, okay? Now, I've known some of the people in this group for 25 years, and I didn't know their story. But when they start to tell me their story, their their story of origin, how they grew up, what's happened in their life, the pain they've suffered, how God has delivered them and changed them, when I get to know them, when I know them, and when I share my story and I become known, something happens. I see the sparkle in their eye. I see their face. And something changes. And I find myself in a joyful place more deeply with those people. And I look out for them. I'm scanning the room when I arrive. Where's my community today? Who are the people? Where are the people that I'm walking with closely? I love everyone here, but where are the people I'm walking with closely? The people that God's joining me to. Because they're the people who are going to help me go deeper in my life. I've shared quite vulnerably here. I'll share more vulnerably there. And they've been doing the same. And God is knitting us together in a deeper level. A way, in such a way that the enemy will find hard to shake when he tries to isolate and separate us. Hard to shake because we've given something of ourselves away. That glad to be with you, joy, sparkle comes into my eye. My brain chemistry is literally changing. Just to hammer this home, right? (laughs) This is what Jesus has to say to the church church in Ephesus in Revelation. Jesus speaks to seven churches at the beginning of Revelation, and that picture of all of everything he has to say to all those churches is a, basically is a picture of everything he wants to say to the church today as well. But the church in Ephesus, he says this, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them to be false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Well done, church in Ephesus, says Jesus. It's pretty good so far, right? But then he goes on. Yet I hold this against you. That's pretty strong language from Jesus. He doesn't muck about, does he? This I hold against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. And he goes on. Now we see in the Gospels that we are, each church is given a lampstand to be a shining example to the world. He says, if you guys don't change your ways, I'm going to remove your lampstand and make you irrelevant. You're doing all kinds of fantastic things as a church, but you've lost your first love. What's your first love? Love the Lord your God with all you've got and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love neighbor. Abide in me, attach to each other. We could do all kinds of great things as a church, but if we are not a picture of what Jesus calls us to be, then he's going to take our lampstand away. That's what he says. I don't want us to have a lampstand taken away. I want to be part of a church that is making a significant impact for the kingdom of God. And so, there's some things to say about this. I guess the question for each of us is something like this. (laughs) Someone press a button for me. Okay, something like this. Is church a meeting to attend or a family to belong to? 
What's it going to be for each of us? Is it going to be a meeting to attend? Thanks very much. Enjoyed that a bit. And now I'm going to go in and forget about it till next week when I come to be fed again. If you were here a few weeks ago when that James Allo, what's his name, spoke, probably picked up a fairly strong message about the idea of I come to church to be fed. Are we going to come to a meeting or are we going to find a family to belong to? And this is a, this is a challenge, but it's an invitation. And it's one I feel a weight about because I do feel that um, we need, as leaders, to, to repent. Because I don't think we've done a very good job since the pandemic, of all kinds of reasons, but since the pandemic, and probably for quite a long time before, of creating an atmosphere where rich communities can really thrive. And so I want to repent to you about that and say, I'm sorry, and we're sorry that we haven't done better. But from this day forward, we're going to do something about it. We are determined to make sure that rich communities become strong. And ideally, everybody who sees this church as part of their home finds a smaller community to belong to where they can find that true attachment. And that's going to be a battle for some of us because it's going to, be, it's going to feel difficult to step in. But this is, it's happening. I was talking to Jonathan here before. There's a new group starting to emerge in Alistair, which is a great thing. Uh, and um, the different places. And we've got a team now who are starting to look at what it looks like to build rich communities once again. So I'm just going to ask some of those people to stand. I can see Wendy there. Do you mind standing, Wendy? Adam is a part of that. Sanjay. I'm sure Leo was here before. There he is. Do you mind just standing, Leo? And Pu- uh, Sandra, Puya. Are you right? There's Puya. And also Arafe. Okay. We have a, she's on kids. We've got an intercultural team that's looking to help us move to a place. Thank you, you can sit down. But can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> Looking to help us find, a, uh, to work out what it looks like to really find, a, to create a context where we can have some really strong communities, where we can do all the things we're talking about today and find that joy, okay? So bear with us, we're doing that. It's our job to facilitate that happening. It's your job to choose whether or not to participate. But my appeal is that we all do. We choose to participate and step into this journey of what it means to be part of a family and belong in a different way and step into where the joy is, okay? So there's a a few other things that we can do. If you, for example, one thing that would be really helpful would be um, if you consider yourself to be part of the church or want to belong to this church and you're not yet engaged on church suite, then the first thing to do is to please talk to the guys at the back there and ask them, how can I engage on church suite? Because this is going to help us work out how we can best facilitate connecting people. The second thing you can do when you've done that, or if you already have, is to update your profile on church suite. Now, these days, there's all kinds of worries that people have around GDPR and privacy data and that kind of thing, and I I totally get it, okay? Um, But I can promise you, we don't go sharing anyone's data. It's just helpful for us to facilitate these kind of things. So if you haven't, for some reason, put your address in there, or you have moved house since you last looked at it, or something like that, it would just really help us if you could update that information so that we can begin to get a picture of what our, our church looks like across the city. Okay? Please, please help us with that. I believe that God is taking us on a significant journey, and he is knitting us together in new ways. And as we go, there is no doubt we're going to have some trouble. There is no doubt that the enemy is going to be at work. In fact, I expect in the coming weeks and months, because so much is obviously happening here, this room's getting fuller every week, there's no doubt that the spiritual warfare is going to increase. And we have to keep remembering that our battle is not against flesh and blood, It's not against each other, though the enemy is going to try and turn us against each other. It's against against principalities and powers. He's going to try and separate us and isolate us and accuse us all the more. But the joy is in him and each other. So my appeal is that we choose to battle through that in order to become a really healthy family. Amen. Can we stand? probably been too long, but at least that's the end of my three weeks, okay?